Hey everybody, this is Tim Chavez with Faith Matters. In this episode, we got to speak with Patrick Mason about his new book, Restoration, which was published by Faith Matters Publishing. When we started the Faith Matters Publishing project, one of our goals was to explore what restoration really means as the church moves into its third century, and that's exactly what Patrick does in his book. In the interview, we got to ask him about the origins of the book, its most important ideas, and what he hopes for the church in the coming decades. One of our favorite insights from Patrick has to do with the meaning of the word restoration itself. He explains that the phrase restored church doesn't appear in any recorded sermons until well into the 20th century, and that its original meaning might really be seen as a call to reach out to the most marginalized and vulnerable in society. That insight alone has changed the way I see my church membership, but I'll let Patrick connect the dots as you listen. Obviously, we can't recommend the book strongly enough, and we hope that you'll pick it up and even share it with others. It's available at Desert Book, Amazon, Audible, and Apple Books. And of course, the book itself has so much more than we were able to cover in this one conversation. It's a brief but powerful read, packed with stories and insights that we really think you'll love. Okay, a huge thanks to Patrick for coming on to speak with us and for all the effort he put into writing what we think is an incredibly important book. Thanks for listening, and we really hope that you enjoy this episode. All right. Well, Patrick Mason, thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. Hey, thanks for having me. It's always great to be with you guys. Yeah, this has got to be, I don't know, the third or fourth time, maybe. You've yeah. got so many good things to say that we just need to keep having you on. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll see about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> this this particular, particular occasion, I think, is a, is a special one um, because... We're releasing, uh, we're releasing this new book, um, Restoration, that you've written, that Faith Matters has, has published. Um, it's been a real honor to work on this with you. And um, we're just, having you know, read it several times over, uh, I, I, we're just super excited to get it out there and think that it's really, really important for really anybody in the church or even outside the church to read to understand, uh, understand what, we're, what we're all about. Thanks. I really appreciate that, Tim. And, and you were a big part of getting this thing over the finish line. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's my pleasure. Um, and it has been, it has been my pleasure. I thought maybe a good place to, uh, to start would be if you wouldn't mind just sort of talking about the origins of, uh, of the book, um, sort of a, just a why this book and why, why now, if that's okay. Yeah, there's, um, there's like three origin stories for it. So I'll see if I can do this uh, yeah. quickly. So, um, so one is that, you know, I, so I published a book a few years ago, we've, we've talked about it on this podcast called, called Planted, um, and it was, um, it was published in 2015, and it was really a response to, to what we were seeing and, and still are seeing in, in terms of what oftentimes is called faith crisis, right? I mean, all, all these people who are um, really struggling with their faith, um, some choosing to stay within the church, some choosing to, to, to leave the church. And, and that book was an attempt, in, in some ways, to, to kind of play defense a little bit, uh, but, but, but to give people some tools. And, and here's how you can think about these, these very difficult and real issues, uh, but maybe in constructive and, and faith-promoting ways, right? The, the leaving the church maybe isn't the only option, uh, that there are some frameworks that you can have. But but and, and, and I'm happy with that book. I, I think maybe it's done some good work. And um, um, but 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 at the end of the day, it was sort of a kind of a playing defense uh, uh, effort. And um, there's different ways of playing offense. Um, but but uh, and, and we see different models of that. But but for me, what I'm most interested in. So one of the origins of this is, well, like, why stick with this? church by stick with this tradition. So it's one thing to play defense, but I think we have to, to put forth a positive vision of what it is about this thing with the restoration or the Mormon, Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What about it is good and true and beautiful and, and worth holding on to, worth you know giving your life to? So I wanted to, to write a book that articulated, at least in some way, that kind of positive um, vision. You know, and so, so, so that, that was part of it. Uh, another part of it was thinking about, you know, 2020 is the 200th anniversary of the first vision. And, and I think there were going to be a lot of things, you know, celebrating and commemorating that and then COVID hit. Um, but still, we have this anniversary. And, and I've been thinking a lot in recent years, okay, we have 200 years of, of the restoration. And I've been thinking about, well, what's going to happen in the next 100 years? Like, what is the third century of Mormonism look like? And that's really, in a lot of ways, kind of the animating question in this book is, okay, 200 years is great, but the past is in the past, which is a strange thing for a historian to say. But um, <laughs> even though I study the past, I live in the present. 
uh, and hope for the future. And so I wanted to, to, to write a book that was at least thinking about what does the third century of Mormonism look like? Um, and, then, and then finally, it was actually, um, I, I mentioned in the acknowledgements, literally the last social engagement that my wife and I had before COVID hit and, and sort of we were all shut down was, was with Bill and Susan Turnbull and, and, and Terrell Givens. Uh, where, where Bill pitched the idea, he said, hey, Faith, Faith Matters wants to publish some books and, 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 and pitched this idea of how do we breathe new life into this tradition that, that we love, right? And that corresponded with things that I'd already been thinking about. So, um, so it's kind of the convergence of those three things all, all came together to, to create this book. Wow. Would you talk a little bit about the title? This was like one of the most interesting parts of the book where you go through this idea of a uh, restored church and, and, and how that really was not a phrase that we even ever heard until I think what, like 1918 or something, it was right. like 80 something years after the organization of the church when, when um, we first hear the phrase restored church. And that just, that blew my mind. So maybe can you talk about restoration, just the word and, and what it meant in the early church? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th this was one of the surprising things for me uh, about this book too. I mean, this book isn't based like on heavy duty historical research. Um, there's a little bit, you know, I can't help myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but, you know, I, I grew up in a church that talked all the time about the restoration, the restored church, the restored gospel, right? Uh, again, we just marked 200 years. We have a new proclamation on, you know, the, the, the restoration. And so, I was just really thinking a lot about like, what is this restoration? Restoring what exactly? And and again, I uh, I grew up with the phrases restored gospel and restored church. I probably uttered those phrases hundreds or thousands of times in, in my life. So just in the course of writing the book, I said, oh, I wonder what Joseph, you know, basically trying to look for some Joseph Smith quotes <laughs> about the restored church. And now we have so many great resources. You can go to the Joseph Smith papers. You can go into early Mormon periodicals. You can do all this. You know, I, I wrote this book during COVID. So I was doing it all literally from this desk I'm sitting at right now. And so I go into the Joseph Smith papers, type in restored church, expect to get a few dozen or hundred zero references, <laughs> except to like the historical introductions, like the modern scholars wrote, you know, yeah. And I'm like, what? I, I figure like I'm doing this wrong, right? I, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the more I searched, like that phrase does, the, the, the phrase itself, restored church, it does not appear in the scriptures. It doesn't appear in Joseph Smith's teachings. Uh, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and now res to restore or restoration, that appears a lot. Uh, uh, sometimes in really prosaic w ways, like to restore a king to his throne or something like that. It, a lot of it has to do with the resurrection, right? Especially Alma talks about that, the restoration of the body and, and the spirit. But like the phrase restore church, as, as you mentioned, the, the first time that I can find, maybe somebody else will come along and, and, and find an earlier usage. But it's James E. Talmadge in 1918, eight, 88 years after the establishment of the Church of Christ in April of 1830. And so that really got me thinking about, about like, you know, what is the restoration? Certainly there's a church component to it. And the other thing too, is like, I noticed for the first time, I mean, like, duh, I should have noticed this earlier in, in the articles of faith, it does talk about the restoration, but not in the one about the church. It's, a, it's about yeah. the restoration of the, of, the, of the tribes of Israel, right? And whenever Joseph Smith did talk about restoration, almost always it was about Israel. So that just got me thinking about like, what the heck, right? Yeah. And, and we've heard President Nelson talk about this, about the restoration of Israel, the gathering of Israel, which in some ways seems, um, it, I think that language can seem quaint or archaic or something. But so again, I wanted to kind of breathe new life into this and like think mm -hmm. about what does this mean to restore Israel in the 21st century? Yeah, and I, that was absolutely mind blowing to me too. So much so, not that I didn't believe you, but I did my own search <laughs> as well. There's this really cool Please website. Please tell me that you came up with the same results. <laughs> I did. I did come up with the same results. Yeah, 1918, James Talmadge. There's this really cool website, lds-general-conference.org, yeah. the corpus the corpus of, conference, of general conference talks, where you can just search as an entire database. Um, but yeah, 1910s, two mentions, and it just kind of increases in increments until... Uh, the 2010s, 75, 75 mentions of the phrase restored church. And so, so that's why for us, it, it just seems totally natural, right? Yeah. And, so, and so 
So you'd think, oh, this is the way they've always talked about it. I, I love that site that you just mentioned, yeah. the General Conference Corpus. I use it all the time. Yep. And it's precisely for this. Like, no, the way we talk about things now is not the way they've always talked about it. You yeah. know, e even in a relatively short 200 year history, the, the huge changes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I wonder too, I mean, I haven't done this search, but it would be interesting to hear how much we talk about restoring Israel now relative to back then. Because like from my perspective as a sort of an early millennial on that, like generationally, like I, to be totally honest, don't relate a lot to the restoration of Israel as like a day-to-day -day thing that I'm thinking about or, or caring about. And so that was another fascinating part of your book. And I would love for you to dive in to that and say like, is that something that's relevant uh, today and why, why does it matter? Yeah, I feel the same way. Like I'm, I'm late Gen X. I mean, I think we're probably yeah. not, not that, that far apart. Yeah. But, um, so, so actually when President Nelson started talking about this, you know, with, in, in his president, and, and, and it has been a major theme of his presidency, the gathering of Israel, like part of it, like, I was like, well, I mean, I, I, I knew enough, you know, I've read the Book of Mormon enough to know that it talks a lot about Israel, right? And I know Isaiah talks a lot about Israel. I, I, and I've read enough early Mormon literature to know that there are a lot of references. They talked about it all the time in the 19th century. So I knew that, but it was partly trying to figure out like, what does this mean? In the 21st century, like what is President Nelson talking about? Now, I don't. I'm not presuming the to speak for him, right? I, he's he's fully yeah. capable of speaking yeah. for for himself. Um, and you know, and of course, part of it is missionary work. I mean, that's, I think that's traditionally the way we understand the gathering of Israel, right? Missionary work. But although he's talked about it on both sides of the veil, which is really interesting, you know, temple work as as part mm -hmm. of this as as well. But but for me, as as I and, and so I fully grant all of that. But you know, we. I, th I think I'm sort of, and probably our generation is on the tail end of having heard all this stuff about like the 10 tribes of Israel. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I've, you know, heard things about like them going to the North, like, where are they? I mean, you know, all this kind of speculation that I think was probably more prominent in our parents and grandparents generation. Right. But I think now in the church, we're much less confident in knowing who or what or where the 10 tribes of Israel are. Right? So we have an article of faith about this, but like, what does that mean? And then the other part of it, uh, the other, the, the, the major usage in the Book of Mormon about the restoration, when they talk about restoring Israel, but also restoring the Lamanites, right? This very specific branch of it. And again, I think we grew up in, in a church on the, on the tail end of being very confident in knowing who the Lamanites were. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. uh, that um, they are the principal ancestors of the Native Americans. That's what the uh, Book of Mormon the introduction, introduction yeah. used to say. In our lifetimes, the church has revised its understanding of that. And now I think the introduction says something like among the ancestors or, or, or something like that. And, you know, the controversies around DNA evidence and so forth. Um, so I, I think we're just much less confident in 2020. Mm -hmm in identifying who the lost tribes of Israel are or who the Lamanites are. So, so, so if we don't have that, right? And, and I'm willing to sort of say, okay, God, you, you've made a lot of promises about this. I'll let you take care of that, right? In the meantime, what can I do? Well, what's, what are the Lamanites and what are the lost tribes? What does what scattered Israel have in common? They have in common experiences and histories of marginalization, of persecution, of scattering, of being despised, of being deemed as filthy, and so, so for me, like in terms of likening the scriptures or thinking about this, I, it, it seems to me that the restoration project that we are called to today, if I'm not exactly sure who the lost tribes are, if I'm not exactly sure who the Lamanites are, I can see people around me who are scattered, who are despised, who are marginalized, who are victimized, who share a kind of common experience, if not exactly the same history as Israel and the Lamanites. And it seems to me that that is where our restoration work is called towards. And this can be all, all kinds of communities. It can be refugees. It can be victims of violence, domestic violence, domestic abuse, other kinds of things, sexual violence. Uh, it, it can be members of our own congregations or families who are marginalized for all kinds of reasons. It can be single members of the church. It can be divorced members of the church. Uh, anybody who thinks differently or looks differently, LGBTQ members, right? That the, These are the people um, still racial minorities in a predominantly white church, especially in North America, right? That um, I'm not saying they are Lamanites or that they are the lost tribes, but there's a kind of shared experience of, of marginalization. And it seems to me that, that that's part of what the Restoration Project is, is, is meant to do, is, is to bring 
the human family to wholeness. That's, yes. that's what God is trying to restore. He's trying to restore his family. I love, I love that line so much like that. I, that feels so it feels like new life, like breathing new life. That was just a, that was a great way to put it. Would you talk about the fortress church maybe right now? Because I think this is, this is like the, the first big, like stumbling block. Like we have, we have built this very safe place for ourselves that can be stifling for some people and also can be a um, problematic trying to give our gifts. So I love this metaphor. If you could just, if you could share that with everyone. Yeah. So, so just to, to share the story and where this comes from. So we, we spent a few months in Romania uh, as, as a family in, in 2015 um, uh, on, a, on a Fulbright. And so we traveled around. Uh, Romania is just gorgeous. If you ever get a chance to, to go there, I definitely encourage it. I, I sound like the Romania Travelers Bureau. But um, <laughs> but uh, but it, the, the great thing about it is that like you can go to castles and historic sites and they're not walled off. There's no gates. There's, I mean, you just like, can go climb on castle walls. It's, it's very fun, wow. especially if you, if you have kids. And so we went to this one little town like out of the way. I, I wasn't sure that you know, we would actually get there. Um, and, uh, but, but we, this place called Viscri and it has this 12th century fortress church. And this, this is distinctive to this region where yes, it was the church. It was where people gathered for worship, but it was also literally a fortress. It was, it was like a cat. In fact, we were talking about it with our kids last night. They said, Oh, we just thought it was a castle. Right. Oh. <laughs> and because that's oh. the walls and the parapets and the narrow little slits that, you know, you'd shoot arrows through. And what, what people would do is, you know, when, invaders came or whatever, they would gather into the fortress church. Um, so it was literally a place of gathering and safety and, and so forth. So, um, so so we went and had this experience, great experience exploring this fortress church. But the more I thought about it, I was like, that it's a great place to go, but it's, it's just a museum at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it has no relevance to the modern world. Um, and it's, and, and it just seems to me a metaphor for, for what in a lot of ways we had constructed um, in, in, in recent decades, a, a place of safety, a place of refuge, but a place with pretty high walls dividing us from the world, right? We use that phrase mm -hmm. all the time, right? The world, and, and the world is almost always referred to with derision as a negative thing, that's something to be protected against. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that's fine, it provides safety. I, I was raised in, in that, climate had, 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 you know, I've had very positive experiences in a lot of, you know, my wife and I are choosing to raise our children uh, within the safety of, of the church because we think it, it, it provides, you know, a great way to live and, and a great foundation uh, and, and a way to, to approach God and Christ and, and our neighbors. Um, but there are costs to that as well. And, and one of the costs is, is that you become quaint, you become irrelevant, the world passes you by. And, and so, so one of part of what I'm trying to do in, the, in this book and is, to, is to think of it, you know, there, there are times where it's absolutely necessary to raise the drawbridge, you know, to, to, to circle the wagons. I, we do have a history of very real persecution as, as a people. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you, you, but you can't leave the drawbridge raised forever. Um, at some point, if you want to, it, it seems to me that clearly we're called as Christians to have an influence in the world, right? Uh, to not only flee Babylon, but then also transform the world to be light and salt and, and yeast to transform the world. Mm -hmm. That's what Christ calls us to do. You can't do that from inside the fortress. So at some point, you've got to lower the drawbridge. You've got to open yourself up. You've got to be secure enough that you can mm -hmm. actually interact with yeah. the world. And it, it seems to me, I, I could be wrong, but, but it seems to me that we're at a moment in our history um, where, where we can lower the drawbridge a little bit more, open the windows and, and engage, uh, because it seems to me that's the only way that we can fulfill our mission, not just to gather people to the Fortress Church, right, but mm -hmm. to actually go out and spread our influence and do good in the world. Yeah. I love that um, analogy that you use of, of light and yeast and salt, and I would love for you to talk about that, but I also wanted to ask, um, like, obviously, we're, we're saying that we should lower the drawbridge, get out into the world, influence it with the good that we have, um, but I, I think there is at least traditionally a reluctance to be influenced by the world. Like the, again, the world sort of in air quotes, like has these connotations within the church of being, uh, uh, being, you know, wicked or deceived or whatever it is. Like what, what is an appropriate way for us as church members who want to engage the world to be, to let it influence us 
for good as well? Yeah, it's, that's a great question, Tim. And, and, and that is the fear. And, and there are plenty of scriptures that we can cite about this, right? About fleeing the world, fleeing Babylon, right? Um, not being polluted by it. And this is, um, this is the kind of dance that we have to do. Part of it comes with, with a kind of maturity, um, mm -hmm. both individually, but also as, as a church. That are we, do we feel secure enough in our beliefs? Do we feel secure enough as individuals and as a community that actually we, we can go out, we have something to offer, we, we, can, we can learn from others without losing what we have? Um, that actually we, we do have something to add to the conversation. We have something distinctive mm -hmm. to offer. That, you know, that it, to, to, to raise the drawbridge and, and, and to close the shutters, it is a defensive position because you, you are worried about losing what you have. Um, and, and again, that's a completely legitimate option. And there are times for that. But, but there's also with confidence and with maturity, a certain level of security. And, and most Latter-day Saints live in places in the world where they're not being actively and violently persecuted. They might be made fun of, um, but, but we're not being hunted by mobs and, and, and things like that. And so, so we have that base level of physical security and in most places, even kind of legal and constitutional security, that then we can go out and um, having built our testimonies uh, and that th th we can go out and, and be confident enough to, to, to share with, with other people. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, this, this is why still the church and families are so important, right? To form people in, in the faith, to mm -hmm. form people, to give people the tools and the confidence they need to, to, to then go out in, in, into the world, both to share with the world what we have, but also to learn from the world. I mean, one of the, mm -hmm. one of the things I'm trying to communicate with this book is that we do not have a monopoly on God's love, God's favor, or on knowledge. We are two tenths of 1% of the world's population at best, right? Yeah. And are we so arrogant as to think that God has shed all his light and love and knowledge on two tenths of 1% of his children. No, because the scriptures tell us and, and first presidency statements and so forth. And so part of our theology is that God sheds his light and love on all of his children. So if he's right. doing that, shouldn't we maybe learn from them, from the light and love that, that he's given them? So, so it, it does require discernment, right? Um, not everything that's out there in the world is good. We, we can say no. We, we, we can say, no, we don't believe that. No, we don't accept that. No, I won't do that. Uh, we can do that. Um, but that comes with strengths and, and, and maturity and, and confidence. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that you talk about that, that we're, our goal is not to trade this fortress church for a religious mm -hmm. empire. We're not trying to, to baptize everyone. And, and it's so funny because we talk about light, salt, and yeast all the time, but it never occurred to me that all of those things are so infinitesimally small. You know, they're like, right. that is us. Like it just, it, it has always worked. Um, but, and I, I think maybe that kind of takes care of this idea of exclusivism, but I wondered if you would talk more about relativism versus particularism. I love the paradigm of particularism. I think that that was an interesting take that I hadn't really considered before your writing. Um, but I guess in particular that my question is, does that leave some sort of imperative? If there's, if like, how is it different than, than, than relativism? Like, does it mean that because we have these particular gifts that we could choose other particular gifts and they're equally good. And so it doesn't really matter, you know, where you serve from. So could you just talk about that? Could you talk about that? that yeah. So, so I, I use this, um, I use a couple of different metaphors to, to describe this and, and it is, you know, essentially to set it up that normally when we talk about the truth of a religion, we're in one of two paradigms. We're either in an exclusive paradigm or an mm -hmm. exclusivist paradigm, which is there's one true truth, right? One way, one, and that's the one way to heaven. Everything else is wrong, right? Because if, if right. A is correct, then B and C and D and E, you know, have to be incorrect. Um, yeah. And maybe the majority of, of religious believers throughout the history of the world have, have adopted some version of a kind of exclusivist paradigm. Uh, a, yeah. Another paradigm is a kind of relativist paradigm. And this is the kind of, there's many paths up the mountain, right? Um, and however you get up there, yes, the, at, at the bottom, the, the experiences, the trails look a little bit different, but by the time you get to the top, it's basically the same thing, right? And, mm -hmm. and we're all gonna reach the same thing. And so it, it doesn't really matter all that much which path you took. 
up, up the mountain. Um, I, I think there's strengths and weaknesses of both of those positions. Um, but but what, I, what I try to offer in, in this book is, is, like you said, what I call particularism, which I think is sort of draws from both of these. And so here are the metaphors that, that I have for this. So, so one is a kind of farming metaphor, which is dangerous for me to use because I'm not a farmer and I know very little about growing things. But, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm the one that has to answer the angry emails from farmers. Back here. Yes, exactly. Right. So if I got stuff wrong, please email me. Um, uh, so I, uh, so, so let's, you know, we talk all the time about the Lord having a vineyard. Let's, let's think about him having a farm, right? And, and, he, and, and we know that he calls laborers, this is Jacob 5, right? He calls people to work in, in, in his farm. And, you know, I, I just think that, I mean, there's so many things to grow. There's wheat and oranges and cherries and zucchini and, and everything else, right? And, and this, is a, this is a big, diverse farm because you've got to have, you know, all this balance and, and, and this, just the, the giftedness of the diversity of, of life, right? And so, um, it seems to me, as, as I look around, that that he that, that certain people, certain communities, are just better at doing certain things than others. They seem mm-hmm. to have been given a gift or even a calling to, to do certain things. And now there are some things that are that everybody can do. Everybody loves their families, right? Every, everybody, you know, everybody can pray. Every, you know, so, so there are certain things that are sort of common to all of us. But there are other things that just the certain communities seem to have, you know, it's like God said, you grow the oranges, right? And be the best orange grower that, that you can be. And, and you grow the zucchinis. And, and what happens is if you do, if you neglect your job, it means there's no oranges for anybody. Um, but if you do your job well, then you can come and you can exchange and you and you can you can give your oranges to other people and other people can give you zucchinis and 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 you can actually benefit from all of the different gifts and fruits that yeah. the, the, the God has given. But it is absolutely essential for you to do your work. He has said, he said, Aubrey, I've been, I've given you gifts and I've called you to grow oranges, right? Mm-hmm. And so you have to do it. It's got to get done. In, for, for, for the whole farm to thrive, right? Um, and yes. so, so there's one metaphor. Another metaphor is the body, right? That we, the, within our, and, and this, I'm sort of riffing off of Paul's metaphor of the body of Christ here, right? That, um, okay, you've got eyes and a heart and a liver and toes and fingers and all these kinds of things. And they're all called to do particular things. If, if, the, if the finger wanted to do what the eye could do, first of all, it's not equipped to do it. But if the finger chose not to do its job because it really wanted to be an eye, then the, the body wouldn't work. The, the, mm-hmm. the body is built on this principle of particularism that every part of the body has a particular job to do. And it can't say that its job is any more important than, than others, but it's essential, right? So, mm-hmm. so the heart's work is absolutely essential. I mean, try having a functioning body without a heart, right? But the heart also can't say I'm more important than anything else because the because the heart relies on and is part of a system with everything else. So here's the thing: is that your heart is essential. It is unique. It does work that no other part of the body does. But it can't. It, it it's not alive by itself. Right. right? And yeah. and so it seems to me that that there's a kind of that this is one way to think about our religious communities, including our church, that yes, um, that we make these claims and, and we have a claim in Doctrine and Covenants 1 is that the only true and living church, right? Um, well, how, how do we think about that in the context of all these other things? Well, it seems that we've been asked to steward or do certain jobs. Mm-hmm. We haven't been asked to do everything, but we've been asked to do certain things. We have stewardship over restoration scripture. We have stewardship uh, over a certain kind of priesthood. We have a stewardship over temple rituals, right? We've been asked to grow certain crops or perform certain functions within the body. If we don't do it, it doesn't get done. Yeah. But it's absolutely essential because it contributes to the whole. And, and at the same time, we can appreciate what the Muslims are doing, what the Catholics mm-hmm. are doing, what the, what the Hindus are doing, because they've been called to do things too. So we can both draw from and benefit from their good gifts and their callings and what God has gifted them with at the same time of feeling absolutely confident that what we're doing is, is critical and God has called us to, to do it. Now, is there some fluidity and can people kind of change garden? I mean, you know, we, you know, we, we can talk about that. Right. And, and none, um, all of these things, um, you know, there, there's some permeability in, in the, the borders between these different plots. But I, I think for, for me, it's a way, and all metaphors fail eventually, right? But it, it's, it's a way to think about 
how can we appreciate the truth and the goodness that we see in mm -hmm. religions around the or, or in our friends who don't have any religion at all? And so how can we appreciate and learn from all those things without giving up the farm, right? Or, or without yeah. weakening our commitment to what God has, has called us to do. Yeah, and I feel like, yeah, I feel like that that's such an important part of the discussion, like for the people that I, I'm just thinking about what you said, the permeability of the of the borders in the vineyard. Like, I, th I think even just this week, I saw a comment on social media. Someone said they, someone was really wrestling, like, can I stay in the church? Like, should I stay in the church? And, and someone made a comment that said, um, like, if it's not if you don't believe that it's the only way, like, why would you stay? And, and I think for a lot of people, there are they actually have answers to that question. Like they have dozens of answers to that question. Like they, this, this work in this vineyard is so fulfilling to them and they feel like it's giving their life meaning and they can see the good that they're putting out in the world. But for the people who, who like are not having that experience for, for whom the church really is just painful and they don't feel like they're able to contribute with the gifts that they were born with, you know, then, then what for them? Like in this, in this paradigm of particularism, like, is there, is there some imperative that like you have to work where you were where you were planted or like can you can you find a, a place that feels more healing to you if the church isn't healing you know or if the church isn't feeding your soul or helping you to feed the world Is yeah that, it's it's, you know? it's a terrific terrific question and yeah i mean my, my my default is is the sense of you know sort of bloom where you're planted but like you say that doesn't work for everybody and some people it's really do experience um our church our community for whatever reason, they experience it mm -hmm. as a place of harm. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I am not an advocate of self-abuse, right? Of, of people mm -hmm. uh, staying, uh, I'm not a therapist, a psychologist or, or any, any, anything like that, but, um, but I don't think people have obligations to stay in harmful and abusive mm -hmm. uh, relationships. Um, I don't think overall, you know, some people want to claim that the church is inherently an abusive or harmful culture. I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. Yeah. Um, because my experience is different and the experience of millions and millions of other people is, is different than that. But I absolutely yeah. recognize that, that, that it can be and has been a place of harm for some people. And so I, I think this, this metaphor, and again, it's only a metaphor um, of, of, of the farm, you know, if, if you feel, um, you know, particularly gifted in another way, right? Or if you feel called to a different place, then then go do that. I mean, one of my messages, I talk, I talk to a lot of people who are in faith crisis and are, are either out of the church or on their way out of the church. Or, you know, um, while I want them to appreciate, part of this metaphor is to recognize that even if you're not called to, to, call, to, to grow oranges, right? Or if that was a bad experience for you, for you, even when you leave that, to recognize that actually God has still called other people, your, your, mm. your former co-laborers, that they're still having good experiences and that the oranges yeah. are good, right? Yeah, maybe there's a few rotten ones, you know, again, the metaphor yeah. might yeah. Yeah, <laughs> after a while. No, but right? I, I mean, yeah, that's but, a great but, way to put um, it. But even if you're called out of that or, or feel like you've got to go do something else, first of all, go do something else, right? So mm -hmm. have a kind of positive thing that, that, that you're going to do and that you're going to contribute and think about what are your gifts that yeah. you're going to contribute to the to the wholeness of the human family because that, that's what i'm saying is that god has called us all to restore the wholeness of the human family he's, he's just given right. a saying or way of doing it and so but but also to recognize that the people you left behind are still doing some good work um even yeah. if it wasn't good for you yeah and i wonder like how much i wonder I wonder how much the fortress church is part of that pain. Like maybe that is so much of the problem. And when we kind of take those walls down and drop the, the drawbridge and, you know, open the shutters, like you were saying, like maybe that fresh air will be enough to, to make the church feel more healing to people who feel like there's just not room for them right now in the, in these, with these high walls, you know? Yeah. And, and that's one of the casualties of exclusivism. There, there's, there's some good things about exclusivism. It gives you a lot of confidence and security and feeling like you're on the right path and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all those, I mean, there, there are some benefits to it, but um, it, but it, you know, painting the world in kind of black and white uh, terms like that, if it's not working for you, you can feel like you're broken um, mm. uh, or that the world is broken. You can feel like you have no place in it. Or that if you leave and you, if you go from one team to another, all you can see is the bad. So Patrick, uh, the last couple of chapters of the book sort of are dedicated, at least in large part, to um, 
sort of what the restoration might look like in the third century, including sort of like some of the, you know, rotten oranges that we could get rid of. I'm just going to plow with this metaphor. Yeah, just, just, just go with it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so good. <laughs> um, and, and then later on, like, what are some of the, the things that we really have to offer the world? One of the, and one of the things in that first group, um, those, those rotten oranges, I, that really resonated with me was this idea of, of fundamentalism and you introduce your metaphors mm. are, are really, really good, by the way. And you introduce <laughs> here the metaphor of the, of a, of a skyscraper. It's, I mean, it's very brief, but could you talk a little bit about, about that and what the danger, the danger yeah. of being too rigid? That was a good one. That's yeah. Um, so, you know, so in, the, in that chapter, like you said, I, I lay out a few things that, that I think have um, sort of some baggage that we've taken on, on along the way. So over, over, over the past 200 years, things that weren't necessarily or didn't have to be part of this restoration project, but that we picked up. And, and that's only natural. I mean, that's, that's, that's what happens when you're part of history and culture and so forth. You pick up things along the way. Um, but, but I think we have to have a, a kind of critical appraisal of, of those things that, that we picked up. And I think one of those things is, especially in the 20th century, was a tendency towards fundamentalism. And I don't mean Mormon fundamentalism like the, the polygamous, you know, mm -hmm. the FLD, FLDS church here. I'm thinking here more in terms of like Protestant fundamentalism, of a, of a very literalist, strict reading of scripture, um, uh, you know, very high boundaries, uh, you know, between right and wrong, very, very um, kind of um, dualistic worldview. And, and I think we, in a lot of ways, that was, I, 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 that was a big part of the church that I was raised in. You know, this, mm -hmm. this is the legacy of Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie and, and others. And um, again, a lot of strong points about that, a lot, a lot of things that, that we could say of, of how that contributed to the, to the strength of the church. But what it did is it created a really rigid system. Part of it is we had an answer for everything. I mean, literally, Joseph Fielding Smith had answers to gospel questions. He had an answer for everything. And it was, and it was done in such, um, you know, uh, just an absolutist type of way, right? I mean, this was the answer. This is what God thought, you know, Mormon doctrine, right? The book that, that, that sat on all of our shelves um, and uh, in very authoritative language. Well, the, 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 the problem with that. And, and, and so here's where the more metaphor comes in, that the when engineers build skyscrapers, and again, I'm not an engineer, so engineers, right, Tim, with all your uh, <laughs> uh, problems with the metaphor. So, but, but engineers, my understanding is that when they big, build big, huge structures like a skyscraper or a bridge or something like that, they actually build in a little bit of give a little bit of leeway. So actually, you know, at the top of, you know, a really tall skyscraper, there's several inches of give in that. So the, when the wind blows or, you know, when there's storms or things like that, the building literally moves with it. Trees do the same thing, right? I mean, this is the same mm -hmm. principle. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so the principle here is that if, if you build too much rigidity into the system, it actually becomes harmful to, because when the stresses come, when the, it, it, it seems really strong and it is really strong, but when extreme stress comes on it, then it actually fractures it. It, 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 it uh, the, the, the thing will fall apart. Whereas if you build just enough, you, you don't want too much because you don't want building, you know, mm -hmm. buildings aren't, aren't meant to be wet noodles, right? But if you, but, but if you build just the right amount of, of flexibility into the system, it's actually better uh, designed to withstand the storms that come. So for me, what I see is that, for instance, let's, let's just say, for instance, like the CES letter, which um, I think it was a kind of natural and inevitable response to the kind of fundamentalistic tendencies within the church, a kind of all or nothing, black or white, mm -hmm that we have an answer for everything, every little thing. And there's this feeling like, oh, if you can pick these things apart, right, then the, then the whole thing falls apart because it, because it was built on an assumption of rigidity, of it's all mm -hmm. true. But I, again, I think systems are stronger, uh, both in the natural world and in the built world, when they have a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of give, um, uh, the, the system actually uh, counterintuitively uh, is, is stronger when, when you build yeah. flexibility into it. And is there I, anything that you see that, you know, people like us, just lay members of the church can do to contribute to that, uh, that flexibility? I mean, um, obviously in the past, some of this rigidity, like you pointed out, has come from upper echelons in the church. And I think we're definitely seeing a move in those same echelons today uh, toward more flexibility. Um, but, you know, is, is it just a matter of, you know, waiting and 
we just bide our time or is there is there some way to contribute to a, a more structurally sound uh, building, you know, in this in this case? Yeah, well, I mean, for, for me, the, the church is first and foremost local. I mean, yes, I'm part of a global church that's headquartered in Salt Lake City, um, and I sustain the, the prophets, the ears, and revelators there, but my Mormonism is local. My Christianity is local. It's with my neighbors. It's with my ward members, and so that's precisely where we do this stuff, and I think that's exactly where we can actively introduce and model this kind of flexibility in the system. Again, this, this is not about giving it away or, or you know, giving away the, the, the core tenants. I mean, there, ha there has to be a structure. It is recognizably um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We do believe things. We do practice things. Um, but but in, I, I think on the ground level, it looks like generosity. It looks like charity. Mm -hmm. It looks like allowing for viewpoints that are different from your own. Um, and, uh, and actually learning from them uh, that when, you know, Brother Smith gets up, uh, you know, and you can guess what Brother Smith is going to say, and because you've heard him say it a, a dozen times before, uh, but is, is there, is there, the, the fact is that you are still, you're, you're sitting in the pews together, right? There's something that has brought both you and Brother Smith and Sister Jones all in the same church together. There's a reason you're there together, and is, is that, you know, Obviously, the system already has this kind of flexibility built into it. Can we recognize it, right? Mm -hmm. And can we practice it? Can we can we show the kind of generosity towards one another, um, and 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 model that uh, mm -hmm. to, to to people that? Um, and I think we we all do this, right? Whether it's liberals or conservatives or progressives or w w whatever, right? We we have a tendency, and and this is the message we're getting from our culture right now: is to double down wherever you are, double down, right? and um, exclude and vilify other points of view, um, find weaknesses in their argument. That's the first thing you do to criticize and so forth. The church calls us to do exactly the opposite, right? Again, mm -hmm. there's, there, there are some rights and there are some wrongs and, and there, are some, there, there, there are borders of, of how far we can take this. Um, uh, we won't hedge on the divinity of Christ. We, you know, we, we, we won't hedge on the fact that there's a God in heaven who loves us, right? I mean, it, and so there are certain things that, 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 uh, that uh, while we recognize that other people have different views, what it means to be a Latter-day Saint is to, is to believe certain things, but we can be generous towards other people who experience and interpret the gospel somewhat differently than, than we do, and we can emphasize the things that we have in, in common. Um, yeah. Those differences matter, but I think we can engage those in a, in a spirit of charity, uh, mm -hmm. rather than a spirit of, of critique. Yeah, and I, I that makes me think, I, I think a lot of people, maybe in some words, it's less of a problem, you know, hearing hearing especially conservative views from an older generation. And and I think a lot of times it's kind of backwards. It's that, it's that um, people with maybe, I don't know, less conservative or less orthodox views feel like they can't have an opinion while they are working yeah. things out or they can't express it. And so they're very quietly feeling so isolated. And so I, I think that can, I think it can work both ways. Sometimes it means it, expressing an opinion that you know is a little bit different and that isn't so safe, but just being brave to say, I'm wrestling with this and open yourself up to that kind of connection because that can, that can really bring people out of isolation and and you know sometimes we do it to ourselves by accident just by assuming that everyone else in the room is on the exact same rigid page and that's never the case that's never the case right no so, absolutely i mean i actually this is one of the things i, I do talk about and planted in, in my earlier book i mean I, I believe so much in the idea of building up kind of social capital and spiritual capital this is why our communities matter so much right mm -hmm. uh the, the ward is just it is an inspired structure. It is the laboratory for Christian discipleship. And the reason why is we build relationships with, with each other. We build a kind of social mm -hmm. and spiritual capital. We feel, you know, if, if you've helped a guy moved in, move in, right? If, if, you, if you've mm -hmm. taught somebody's kids and, and young women uh, or, or, or in primary, if, if you brought a casserole over to them when they were sick, right? Th these kinds of little things that we do, but that build the bonds of affection yes. uh, with, within the community, then it means that, that actually we, we create space for one another um, mm -hmm. to, to, to say these things. And, and so this is what I was, you know, if, and, and you're exactly right, the typical dynamic in most Latter-day Saint wards, at least in, in America, is they, they tend to be more conservative, right? And so if you tend otherwise, you know, you can sometimes feel isolated and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but first of all, you don't have to give up on, on your values and commitments and views. But what, 
what the community calls you to do is is to participate and to serve and and yeah. and to and and to be a Christian first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and Christianity is mostly a lived and practiced thing, not just something in our heads. Yeah. Um, and once that is done, uh, in most cases, not all cases, right? Uh, that uh, you know, we we can probably all cite cases where where just things have have gone poorly. But in most cases the bonds of community are gonna be strong enough when we participate and when we give and serve and, and, and do so not with an agenda, but simply because we're trying to be Christians, mm -hmm. that creates space uh, for, for the kind of generosity to, to, to happen within a ward. Yeah, I love that. We've talked before about that, that Eugene England's The Church is as True as, as the Gospel. And I, to and I think somewhere you call, what do you call it? Like a, your word is the laboratory of love or something, you yeah. know, something really catchy phrase like that. And I totally see that. Like there, I mean, there is a way that Sundays can be really hard because of all of these opinions you bump up against, but at the same time, that can be the most, the while grueling, most connecting thing, just loving people who you totally disagree with. Like what could be more refining than that? Yeah. So, and I'm, I yeah. That and I, I don't want to pretend that it's easy. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, Jesus did not say, I, I never told you it'd be uh, easy. I only told you it'd be worth it. He did not say that, but there's, there's, there's something in that. Well, um, a, a picture on the wall in my house going up begs to differ. Yeah, right, right. Uh, actually, one of my favorite t-shirts my wife gave me for Christmas a couple years ago uh, is, is actually an image of Jesus. And at the bottom, it says, I never said that. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> but um <laughs> but 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 he does call us. What what he did say, you know, is is uh, you know come follow me and basically bear the cross, and um, mm. that uh, there is no no promise that that this thing is is just going to be easy. That, that these the same way it is within a family, right? Families are hard, relationships are hard. That the, the church is nothing if if not just a, a part of the family of God. So yeah. those those relationships are are, are hard. Yeah. yeah. And there's something there's something like you're saying about um, those touch points that you have outside of the walls of the of the church building, like the place to love Brother Smith, at least in my experience, is not in Sunday school. That's where, you know, there's steam coming out of my ears. And <laughs> like when Brother Smith, you know, we had a Brother Smith uh, last night drop off a um, drop off a treat on our doorstep. And it's like, wow, like that really meant something. And I felt, you know, very so much more connected you know, to him than I, uh, than I ever had. And so like, I love the idea that we're um, truly, you know, we're truly following Jesus's example by sort of getting out there and engaging. Um, I, there are much more of the New Testament, obviously, at least the gospels are dedicated to that type of action from Jesus rather than the kind where we're just, you know, sitting and sort of theorizing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and part of what I'm trying to do in this book is to say, I, I actually think that our wards are terrific models of this. They are great laboratories for this, but then we, I think part of now what we have to do in the 20, 21st century is uh, to take, take that beyond the ward to some yeah. degree. We already do. We do a lot of service. We do a lot of humanitarian work and, 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 and all those kinds of things. Um, but all those th the lessons that we've learned, in, in our wards over the past, you know, few generations, uh, and those of us who have had positive experiences and, and have learned what that looks like, um, that, that we take that outside um, because uh, most of God's family lives outside the walls of the church. Yeah, uh, and and so we need to, to to learn to apply those lessons more broadly. Yeah, maybe as we as we wrap up, I would love for you to expand on that just a little bit more. Sort of like, and this is really the last chapter of the book sort of painting the vision for what our particular gifts um, w might, if, you know, if we take advantage of them, allow us, allow us to do in the third, in the third century of the, of the restoration. What are the, what are some of those, those things that, or if you could just sort of paint the vision for what that might look like. Yeah. And, you know, this was kind of a hard chapter for me to write because it's, it's much easier to talk about the past than to talk about the future. Right. All right. <laughs> um, but, uh, or at least I'm more comfortable doing so. But, but yeah, I wanted to think like, okay, so what, what do we do now? What are we, I, I think we are, we are called to do something in, mm -hmm. in, in the world. Um, and w that doesn't mean at the neglect of our families or our, our wards and our churches, but I think we're called to more uh, than that. And so what, what will that look like? Because, because we can't do everything. We are, again, two tenths of 1% of the world population. We, we cannot change the, the whole world all by ourselves. 
part so part of it is going to have to be partnering with people, which is something we have not traditionally been good at. We're getting a little bit better at that in terms of humanitarian relief. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that's a good model for the rest of us to recognize, oh, wait a minute, maybe the Catholics are really good at, at this. And maybe we follow their lead. We don't always have to be in charge. I mean, <laughs> Mormons are good at taking charge because we're so good at organization and we're generally very competent and we've learned public speaking skills and all this kind of stuff. We're, we're not very good <laughs> at, at, at letting other people be in, in, in charge sometimes. Um, but but the, the fact of the matter is that other organizations are way out ahead of us on a, a lot of this, this type of stuff. And so we need to have the humility to recognize where good work is being done and then, and then come and say, hey, guess what? We don't have any expertise in this area, but I can bring like 20 guys with me or I can bring, you know, mm -hmm. you know 15 young women with me. And, and so teach us and help us to, to, to help the community. And so, so I think we have to, so I, I lay out a few ideas of what I think our particular gifts might lead us to, to, to try and make an impact on in, 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 the, in the restorations third century. I think part of it could be around issues revolving around refugees and immigrants, giving our, our own history. Um, that I think that comes from a very deep place within us to recognize the plight of refugees and immigrants. And again, the church has been good on this. I think at, at the local level, we can be even better. Um, I think, you know, we do hear a lot of talk uh, from, from the church about religious liberty and religious freedom that can be coded as political language. And I, I think in America, unfortunately, it has sort of been coded that way. It doesn't, it should not be. Um, there are people who are persecuted for their religion all around this world. It is a real issue in the 21st mm -hmm. century. And I think Latter-day Saints should absolutely stand up and speak for the religious freedom of every woman, man, and child on this planet, including the religious freedom and religious liberty of atheists. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a report that shows that Utah is one of the most hostile places in the country for atheists. Um, that should be a scandal uh, for, for yeah. Latter-day Saints, that we should, um, you know, um, that article of faith should should be inclusive of people who choose not to worship God, as well as those uh, who, who do. I loved um, how I loved how you said like it's we lose credibility when we only stand up for religious freedom when it's when it's us, when it's when us. It's, yeah. you know, it's our own. It can't be special pleading. It can, it, 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 people see through that immediately. Right. And that is when it becomes political. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, so I lay out a few options there. But really what I, I think what it comes down to is is people, first of all, getting outside the fortress church enough to figure out what are the needs in the community, right? Be mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, Logan, Utah is, is going to be different than Los Angeles, which is going to be different from, you know, rural North Dakota, right? In, in terms of the resources that, that we can bring, but also the needs. Um, and, and of course, then take into, a, you know, the Sao Paulo and, and Manila and, you know, Johannesburg and all these places around the world. So part of it is the Latter-day Saints need to engage their communities by learning what the community needs. We've been so good at, at giving people answers for the past two centuries. Mm -hmm. that we've sometimes not been very good at asking questions and listening. Um, we've been in, that's what missionary mode is, is you come with all the answers and you have something to give. And again, I don't want to, we, we, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. We can keep sending out missionaries, but also, frankly, I think our missionaries will be more effective the more that we learn to listen to the world's need and, and customize what does the restoration have to say to all these people and to a world in need. Uh, because the world's needs now aren't the same as they were in 1820 when Joseph walked out of that grove. And so, so really my call to, to anybody who reads this book and to any Latter-day Saint is to look around at your community, where you live, where you can make an impact, uh, figure out what the needs are, uh, and, and, then, and then out of your deepest convictions as a Latter-day Saint and as a Christian, go meet that need. And it's going to look different in your ward than in mine. It's going to look different in Utah than it does in Texas. That's okay. We don't, you know, we, we can move away from the kind of cookie cutter, one size fits all uh, uh, type religion to, to recognize that, you know, one of the doctrines of Christianity is the incarnation that God entered the world in its specificity, in history. God, Jesus wasn't like a human of all time. He was a Jew in first century Palestine. Right. And he met the yeah. needs of the people right in front of them. They had leprosy. They had, you know, they, they were a colonized people. I mean, there were specific needs and he spoke to them. That's what the incarnation means for us today. That's what the restoration means for us today is what is God calling you to do 
where you are placed, where you are planted right now. And so act out of that, out of your deepest testimony and convictions, and then, and then bring your friends with you. That's what we can do as Latter-day Saints. We can bring numbers, right? Organize your Relief Society, your Elders Quorum, your ward, your stake, right? To, to, to go out and, and, and make a difference. That's awesome, Patrick. I think that's a, I mean, that's a perfect place to end. I think that really sums up the message of the book. It's a very hopeful, it's a very optimistic book. Um, I, I just so much enjoyed reading it and I'm so excited to, to get it out yeah. there because I think it's going to be so meaningful to so many people. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Thank Aubrey. you this so much. Okay, appreciate you. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much again for listening and a special thanks again to Patrick for coming on to speak with us about restoration. Again, we'd love for you to grab a copy of the book at Desert Book, Amazon, Audible, or Apple Books and share it with friends and loved ones. Thanks again for listening and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.